Good evening. I'm going to take it somebody was upset with me talking about Alaska weather and adjusted the thermostat tonight. It's a little warm in here. Uh, Cope may be gone before we're done. We'll see what happens. Dads, I hope your family's treated you well for Father's Day this afternoon. If you were not here this morning, you can go ask your neighbor about that. I won't go back into it again. We're going to be talking uh, during the month of June about grieving uh, and about grief. And let me encourage you with a couple things as we begin this. Uh, first of all, if grief is not your kind of topic, um, it's not mine either, to be quite honest with you, but I think it's something uh, that is inevitable. There are a lot of common experiences we have in life, but grief is one of those that at some point in life hits all of us. And so if you think to yourself, you know, I really don't want to go be depressed uh, every Sunday evening during the month of June, I hope it won't be that. I hope we'll have some encouragement in the midst of it too. Uh, secondly, if you feel like, you know, I'm not really dealing with grief or I understand how to handle grief well, uh, it'll be okay, I don't really need this, know that maybe this is for you and things you're dealing with or things you will deal with, or maybe it's because you are around someone who is dealing with these things uh, or will be. And I think we will see that that will be the case in all of our lives, that if we are not grieving ourselves, that we will be around people who are. And something we can learn, I think, from the book of Job is, uh, things seem to be going pretty well while his friends are just there, and then they open their mouths. A and suddenly everything goes downhill uh, as far as Job's attitudes and what's going on and what the friends have to say. And there's a lot of struggle that happens largely because of what they say. So I think it's worthwhile for us as people, even if we are not grieving currently, to maybe have a better idea of how grief works uh, and what we can do to be helpful in that situation. Uh, I also, by the way, with the series, went back and forth in titles several times about what I wanted to call this thing, and I thought overcoming grief several times, but that may give the false notion that this is always something that can be overcome. Sometimes grief just becomes something that you live with, and it's at different levels in life, so I thought we would go with understanding grief. Uh, maybe if it's something we can understand better, then we can learn how to deal with it uh, a little better. Uh, for tonight, I call this Valleys, uh, because what came to mind for me was where we lived in Oregon. Uh, we lived in the Willamette River Valley there in Eugene, and there were the uh, coastal region mountains on the west of us and the Cascades on the east of us. Uh, the Cascades are about 10,000-foot mountains. Uh, if you've ever flown a plane into Portland, you will fly right next to Mount Hood. It's one of those mountains. Uh, we had several other ones to our east, and then on the west side, before you got to the coast, we had mountains that were more like the two to 3,000 foot range, which is kind of like your Smokies, I guess, over in Tennessee. And we were there in the valley, which did a lot of things for us. Everybody assumes when we moved to Oklahoma from Oregon that we came from a place with lots of snow to a place with less snow. Uh, we've now lived here in Oklahoma actually a little bit longer than we lived in Oregon. And I will tell you, we have had more snow days here in Ada than we had in Eugene, which probably baffles a lot of people. But we were sheltered from all of that there in the valley. The other thing that happened a lot is the grayness would just kind of settle in. Now, they told us about that when we were moving there. They said, now, you, you got to understand, there are times here where it's just very kind of gray. W when we went to interview there in Eugene, it was sunny and clear the whole time we were there. And we thought, wow, this is great. This is really nice. It's, it's sunny, but it's mild. We went over to the coast for a few days. It was sunny and clear there, and they were just dumbfounded to find out that's what we got. The last year we were there, before we came here to Ada, we had 15 days that we did not see the sun shortly before we moved. It was just gray and dreary and cloudy and foggy and sometimes rainy every day for 15 days. People there struggle with vitamin D deficiency because they don't get enough sunlight. They have to take boosters to try to overcome that. It's a, it's a hard place to be in that sense sometimes. And when we think about grief, it's the same kind of thing. It's a place that puts us in a valley where it just seems like we may go days or weeks without the sun. Days or weeks without uh, those moments of joy, those moments where we just feel good about things, and people around us don't really understand what that's like. I, I remember them telling us about the gray there in Eugene before we moved and not really comprehending it until I had experienced it. And grief is kind of that same thing where uh, each of us grieves differently, each of us grieves for different amounts of times, and for some of us that grief just kind of comes back up at weird times where you don't expect it, uh, someone introduces it back to you completely unintentionally, and, and they are, there you find yourselves again. So we will look at grief, first of all, through the eyes uh, of Scripture. Uh, as we begin, there we go, 
Uh, I want to share this quote from C.S. Lewis with you. I was reading his book last week, A Grief Observed, uh, that he writes about the loss of his wife. And he says in that book, all human relationships end in pain. Uh, and I will tell you, this is one of those things I kind of went back and, and read a couple times to try to completely get that into my head. All human relationships end in pain. Now, uh, I hate to correct C.S. Lewis or to embellish C.S. Lewis. If it were me, I probably would have stuck meaning, meaningful in there. All meaningful human relationships end in pain. It is the price of our, that our imperfection has allowed Satan to exact from us for the privilege of love. And if we think about it, isn't that really the truth? If it's not pain for both people, it's pain for one, whether it is in uh, loss or in moving away or in death or in divorce or whatever it may be, just the ending of a friendship, there is usually pain on either one or both sides of that equation. And because of that, a lot of people will shut themselves off from others. And maybe you have been here somewhere along the way, uh, or maybe you know people who are currently there. People who've had a very bad relationship and are hesitant to get into another one. Uh, people who have had a, a friendship that was very close, and so when they lose that friend, they're very hesitant to try to have a friendship like that again. Uh, we have a tendency to try to shield ourselves from pain. We talked a little bit about th that this morning in James chapter 1, that we don't always like the idea of the struggles and the trials, so we'll try to avoid them uh, as best we can. So when sin entered the story, death and grieving became regular occurrences. If you think about all the way back in the garden, I don't believe God's original design, I, I know God has a plan, I know God is all-knowing, so it's hard for us theologically and philosophically to, to exactly figure out how all this works. But when God designs man, God designs man there to be in the garden in a relationship with him. And it seems at least as if that man is just going to live on and on and on. There's that tree of life within the garden that we've made a lot of assumptions about what that means, but it seems like there's some sort of plan that God has that man is just going to live and live and live, and very quickly man decides to go in a different direction. And so then death enters the picture in a very violent way with Cain and Abel, but throughout the Old Testament we'll see death come up again and again, and people react to it in different ways. So throughout the Old Testament, first of all, we see that people grieve for family. Uh, when uh, Sarah dies... Uh, in the land of Canaan, Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So we see this mourning and weeping that begins, or grieving and weeping that begins, when there's a loss of family, something that still happens now. Uh, we see in Genesis 37 that Jacob tore his garments when he thought Joseph had been killed and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And so he had this intensity about his mourning that he didn't want to be comforted. He just wanted to continue grieving. And, and maybe you've been there, by the way. Sometimes people who mean really well come and they try to take us out of that grieving. They come and try to take us to a, a place where we feel comfort and peace. And maybe you're not quite ready to be there yet. Uh, or maybe you were ready and you found yourself back in that grieving again. Not everyone understands the timing. Uh, and the guilt that probably goes around the brothers here too plays a role in that. But they want for Jacob to be better. And Jacob is just not quite ready to be better. We see that people grieve for the families of others. Uh, in the end of Genesis, in chapter 50, it says that 40 days were required for it. That is how many were required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. Jacob has died. Joseph is meaningful to them. He's obviously saved their nation from famine. And so even though they don't have a real connection with Jacob other than Joseph, they haven't grown up around him, haven't known him, they know that Joseph is hurting, and they know that Joseph means something to them. So therefore, they are going to help in that grieving process. They're going to be a part of that. And maybe you've been there too. You've been in a place where maybe you weren't overly connected to the person that has passed on, but the people who are grieving because of that, they mean something to you, and so you go and you try to be a part of that process as well. We see that people grieve for leaders uh, in the Old Testament. In the book of Numbers, it says that when all the congregation saw Aaron had perished, all the house of Israel wept for Aaron for 30 days. Uh, and they did also in Deuteronomy 34 the same thing for Moses. There was this 30-day period uh, of grieving that happened. I'm glad we don't generally do it this way anymore, at least as a whole group. It, it's more of something that happens in a short time. But you will find that, that the people who are closest to whoever has been lost, that grieving will go on, and it's not a set time, is it? Uh, I can't tell you when you've lost your loved one, okay, you've got 30 days. Uh, and in that 30 days, you can grieve as much as you want. But then when that 30 days up, is up, it's time to move on to something else. But here for their leaders, they had that period of 30 days. And this kind of thing is something that has lived on. 
Uh, when I was in college, uh, I went to visit my friend Tim, who lived in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. I went there for, I think it was spring break, if I remember right. Uh, and when I had been there for a couple days, uh, one of the Supreme Court justices at the time died. And so they did what they do when Supreme Court justices or people who are high up in government pass away. Uh, they put his body, I believe it was in the Supreme Court area, if I remember right. It was either there or the Capitol, I've forgotten now. Uh, but he was there, and his casket was there. It was actually placed on top of the same piece of furniture that held Lincoln's casket when he died back in the 1860s. And we went down to the Capitol or Supreme Court, I've forgotten which one, and we walked through. I, have, I can't even remember his name at this point. I know he was a Supreme Court justice, but everyone was going through and witnessing this moment of history and this moment of grieving and everything else. Uh, my friend Tim's mom saw us on C-SPAN uh, walking around the, uh, the casket. It wasn't all that much a grieving moment for me, but it was what people do. We often grieve for leaders, people who are meaningful uh, in our lives. The same thing happens again in 1 Samuel 25. Samuel, who has led Israel and done all these great things and anointed kings, when he dies, these, the people grieve, and they grieve again for 30 days. And then sometimes grieving becomes a community event. When someone who is important to a community suffers, uh, when someone who is important to a community dies, sometimes that whole community may take on grieving. Uh, in John 11, uh, a story we're very familiar with, with of Lazarus when he passes away, it says the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, and they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. And if she was going to weep, this community was going to gather around her, and they were going to weep as well. And I think we have elements of that nowadays, but it's probably a little bit different uh, than it was then. I imagine if we were able to be there and witness this happening there, it would have seemed kind of like a foreign occurrence to us. But to them, this is what they did. When someone passes away, they would all gather around and be part of the grieving that went on. Uh, and then we find that even Jesus grieved. In that same story, Jesus, who knows he could have showed up early to heal Lazarus before he dies... Jesus, who knows before he begins the journey to go there exactly what he's going to do. Jesus, who as he encounters people who basically are telling him, if you had been here, everything would have been okay, and has all the emotions that go with that. Jesus himself, we find in chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. And why does he weep? You know, do you weep over someone that you are about to see? Maybe happy tears as we learned that somewhere early in life. But this weeping is different. This weeping is a weeping that feels the pain that the family of Lazarus is going through, that understands and has compassion for them. And so Jesus grieves along with them. And it's the shortest verse in Scripture, and at the same time, maybe for us, one of the most impactful, to know that wherever we are in the depth of sorrow and grieving, that Jesus is there alongside us and completely understands what we're going through and weeps along with us. So grieving was done in various ways uh, throughout Scripture. And, and again, by the way, I, this is not my kind of thing personally. Uh, I know that we can learn a lot from this. So if you are out there and you're thinking, I really don't want to know this much about grieving, hopefully this will be worthwhile for us and we can see there are different things that go on throughout Scripture. And then we'll connect this to ourselves here in a minute. Uh, first of all, through crying out. And we could probably associate with this one more than anything. Uh, Pharaoh rose up uh, in Exodus 12 at night, and his servants, all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Now, we often look at this story from the other side, don't we? Uh, this is God, the culmination of the plagues. This is God preparing to free his people. But if you were an Egyptian in the midst of all this, uh, and quite honestly, maybe a pawn of Pharaoh in the midst of all this, it is this Pharaoh out there making all the decisions that are affecting your life, Imagine the cries that would go out as each family realizes that their firstborn is gone. Uh, in Mark 5, it says, They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. He has gone to heal, and he finds that there are all these people who are out there wailing because someone has died. There is always this crying out and weeping that has gone with mourning. There was the tearing of clothes, and, and this, again, is where things are a little more foreign to us. This is not something... We normally do, but in Old Testament days especially, it says, uh, Reuben, return to the pit. They have thrown Joseph into the pit instead of killing him. Reuben's plan is to go back and rescue. He gets there. He's not there, and he tears his clothes. Uh, this is just one of those things that people did in those days and times to signify that they were grieving or mourning. They wore sackcloth and ashes. And again, this is a little further even out from where we are. 
but we can understand the idea of wearing black to a funeral, for instance. It's one of those things that people do. Uh, in Lamentations chapter 2, in verse 10, it says, The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground in silence. They have thrown dust in their heads, put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. So the, there were these outward things they would do to show that they were grieving. And some of this was for them. Some of this was their ceremony, the thing that they did. But a lot of this, quite honestly, was probably for the people around them. Uh, wouldn't it be nice sometimes if those of us who were struggling with something wore a sign saying we're struggling with something? Maybe not nice for us. Maybe we don't want to be quite that open and honest with everybody. But as people approach us and understand what to say and what not to say, wouldn't it be nice if they understood something is up here? Uh, I, I think of my, my wife every now and then will wake up upset with me and I won't understand why. Uh, this is uh, the way of men, I guess. Uh, but she'll wake up upset with me. I don't understand why. And I will find out later in the morning, I did something awful in her dream. Uh, in her dream, uh, she was at a restaurant and saw me with another woman. Uh, in her dream, I was supposed to have done something a certain way and did it a different way. And I will remind her, you, you know, that was dream me, right? Uh, actually, nightmare me. Not, not dream, dream me is much better than that. And she will, she will know that rationally, but at the same time, she will be frustrated with me because she's just woken up out of this really realistic dream. I wish sometimes that she would just tell me the first thing in the morning when she wakes up, oh, I had this dream last night, and I will just back away uh, and make sure I, I'm okay. For them, they would wear these things outwardly so people would know. People would understand, I am dealing with something, uh, and because of that, you should be cautious about how you are. Some even hired others to grieve. And I will tell you honestly, a lot of us will read scripture and this piece almost seems comical at times. Uh, at the same time, uh, I would like a good full room for my funeral, so maybe I should start hiring people in advance, being ready for that. I always wonder who's going to show up and what kind of mood they're in, but uh, we, we may want people to be represented there. And so it says in Jeremiah 9, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider and call for the mourning women to come. Send for the skillful women to come. So we learn there are these women there who mourn, and not only do they mourn, but they're good at it. And so these are the people you want at the, your funeral. They are going to, to wear black. They were going to look just somber enough, laugh at the right times, cry at the right times. And so they would bring these people in to make sure the mourning was done properly. So what about today? You know, we, we look at especially these Old Testament things, and they seem very removed from where, where we are today. What about today? Uh, people still grieve for different reasons. Now, we've talked a lot about death to this point, and because we, we're talking about grieving during this month, we, we probably will talk about death a fair amount, but it's not the only reason people grieve, is it? You know, there are people who grieve for uh, the loss of a job. You had a job that you thought was going to be the one, you thought it was going to work out well, you thought it was exactly where God wanted you to be, you thought it was exactly the thing you needed to do career-wise, and it just didn't work out, and you may grieve for the loss of that. You may grieve for the loss of things of some kind. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, Nathan just got his driver's license this week, and so I've been thinking about getting my driver's license, all that stuff. And I learned how to drive a standard on my uncle's 1971 Corvette, uh, which, by the way, is the coolest way you could ever learn how to drive a standard. I'll argue with you all day long. Uh, but when my uncle passed away, my aunt, not too long after that, sold that car. It was the coolest car I ever knew of. She offered for me to buy it at the time. At the time, I was a single guy in my mid-20s, and I learned that the insurance annually for that car actually cost more than what she was offering to sell it to me for. And I thought, I can't do that. It's just not smart to do. And so I said, I better not. I will tell you, even as a preacher who probably should not own a 1971 Corvette, I have many times gone on eBay just out of curiosity. I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have that kind of car? And there's a part of me that grieves the day I said no because I really wanted that car, not just because it's a cool car, but because it was a connection to the uncle who was like a dad to me. We may lose the, uh, grieve the loss of a house. You know, there may be a place we grew up that we have to part with. We may grieve the loss of friendships, of family, not because of death, but because of just the dissolution, dissolution of relationship. We grieve all kinds of things. And so if you have been checked out to this point because you think to yourself, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good with handling death when it comes my way, or maybe death has not come my way. There are other things that we grieve in life. And we also grieve in different ways. And this may be the place in all of this that we struggle the most. Because honestly, the way I grieve is right, and the way you grieve is wrong. 
Uh, my wife loaded the dishwasher today. Uh, I will tell you, normally the dishwasher is my job. Uh, it's one of those things around the house that I feel like I can do, uh, and it gets done, and I don't have to worry about how it's done. It's just done, and so I feel like I'm contributing in some way. And so I will load the dishwasher. When my wife loads it, it's wrong. It is not the way you're supposed to load the dishwasher. She actually said as she was putting the last dish, dish in today, there's room for one more dish when you're done with lunch. It's not loaded properly, and that's okay. And, and I laughed to myself because I knew exactly what she was saying. When I look at other people who grieve, when you look at other people who grieve, you may think the same thing. Uh, I think of the Dixieland Jazz funeral. This is a funeral in New Orleans. Uh, when I was a high school student in Mobile, Alabama, in the band, we played the Dixieland Jazz funeral in our concert season that year. And it was supposed to be a funeral song, and it ended with like this really upbeat part. And it felt wrong as a funeral song. When I look at this, I think to myself, if someone close to me died, someone I truly cared about, was truly affected by the loss of that person, this is the last thing in the world I want. I, I don't want to parade. I, I don't want to go there and try to act like I'm happy when I'm not. I, I want to be able to get through this grieving process, and yet for these people in New Orleans, this is what they do. Now, not everybody in New Orleans does it this way, but, but a lot of people do, and they will have these parades with jazz music. There actually was another picture as I Googled for a picture of this. It was people carrying the casket down the street right behind this group you can imagine what that would be like compared to the funerals you're accustomed to. Uh, I look around town sometimes, and I see these on cars. Uh, this is where you buy them, by the way. Uh, I don't think it's actually your name here. That would be kind of counterproductive. You'd want somebody else's name there. Uh, but I see these stickers on cars, and I think to myself, I would never want that sticker on my car. Now, some of you may have that sticker in your car. I didn't check the parking lot when we came in. But some of you, this may be the thing you want to do. Uh, or I've also seen, apparently dad liked tools, uh, and I, there's this Here's dad, and I'm going to memorialize him through a tattoo. And I will tell you, in either one of these things, I will look at these things and think, this is just not how I would do it. And yet I know for people, every time they walk out to the car and see that sticker, every time they look in the mirror and see that tattoo, it is a reminder of the one that they lost. And this is the, one, the way they decided to go about that. And I will tell you that when we look at others and how they do it, it is neither right nor wrong, it just is. It is the way in which they grieve. When we look at sackcloth and ashes and wailing and professionals and 30 days and 70 days and all of those things throughout Scripture, they are neither right nor wrong. They just are. It is the way that people grieve. And for us, our job as the other people in the whole equation is just to patiently walk alongside, to be available for comfort when we can, to try to understand as best we can, but just to be there. So we should look, first of all, to God in our grief. I think there are some universals. I know we all grieve differently. I know it takes us all a different amount of time. Uh, I know for some of us we will grieve and then move on to something else. I know for some of us we will never leave the grief. But the universals are these. First of all, we look to God. And I think no one says this better than the psalmist. The psalmist understands grief very well. In Psalm 31, he says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also, have you ever been so deep within grief that you just physically feel it? And for some of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It, it may be death, it may be loss of relationship, loss of job, loss of whatever. But you have been there where it just, it, it gets to the pit of your soul. It, it, it almost makes you ill, it makes you feel like you can't move. And the psalmist understands that. He also says in Psalm 25, 17, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. The psalmist understands, if there is a way out of grief, that way begins with God. God is the only one who can carry us through this. And then in Psalm 118, verse 5, Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me, and he set me free. If we are to find freedom from grief, and that's different for all of us, takes different amounts of time for all of us, but whatever that looks like, that comes from God. We also know, that Jesus understands grief. Uh, we oftentimes will read Isaiah 53 around communion time or around Easter time to remember who Jesus is and this great, great prophecy of him. Remember early in the chapter, in chapter uh, 53 and verse 3, it says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jesus is one who gets the idea of grief. He understands what it is to be a person in the midst of grief. 
And we also understand that Jesus has sympathy for us in, in our grief. He doesn't just understand what it is to go through grief, but when you go through grief, he cares about that. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, the Hebrew writer says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So often when we're going through grief, we feel like whoever it is we're talking to doesn't really understand. Uh, even if they've suffered loss, they, they don't understand what my loss feels like. Even if they've been through a similar situation, they don't understand exactly how I feel. Jesus does. Wh whatever it is you think you're growing through, whatever it is you feel at the depth of your soul, Jesus understands that fully and he cares for you fully and is there with you completely. And then Jesus wants us to bring our grief to him. He's not hesitant about this. He, he doesn't want to talk about something else that's more pleasant. He wants you to bring the thing you were suffering with, the thing you were struggling with before him. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. H how do we handle this? We give it all to him. We, we were not designed to handle this on our own. And as much as it's like, uh, nice to share this with one another and to be able to go through these things together, we're not even designed to fully handle it in that way. It's not until we are able to give this to God that we can truly make our way through. So tonight, are you grieving? And like I said at the beginning, there are some of us that are and some that are not. If you have not, you probably will be at some point. Grief is that one inevitable experience that all of us deal with. And if we are, what are we doing with that? And if you're not, then I guarantee you, you are not sitting too far away tonight from someone who is. Or tomorrow when you go to work, you are not going to be too far away from someone who is grieving over something. Maybe something that you understand is a big deal. Maybe something that doesn't seem all that important to you and is so important to them. And if you are, God cares for you and wants you to come to him. So this month as we, we talk about grieving, I'd ask you to bring your grief to him. The thing that you're mourning over, the thing you're struggling with, bring it to him. And that begins, if you're not following him, with following him for the first time, being baptized into his son, and changing your life forever. Or if you have done that, maybe it's coming back to him and remembering where that power comes from. Or maybe for you it begins with bringing that before your church family. If there's some way we can help you in your grief, some way we can help you draw closer to him, please come while we stand and sing.